the title of this talk actually comes from thinking about the deaf and grandfathers group um, and the fact that Deaf Helper has been around for you know, 10, 11 years, something like that. I think I'm going to wait a couple of minutes until uh, just give people a little bit longer to trickle in. So I do hope to have as many people here for this talk as possible just to, you know, indoctrinate some folks. That's what it is. sort of unexpectedly, um, we started making um, some larger changes to Dev Helper that have happened in the past seven or eight years of its existence. Um, and one other thing, if I say Dev Comp accidentally during this talk, I mean Dev Helper. And um, just for other people's information, when I referred to deprecating Dev Helper yesterday, I was referring to Dev Comp. I do tend to get them confused. <laughs> um, I have no plans to deprecate Dev Helper at this time. So, um, you should all be familiar with this, I hope. Uh, this is pretty much how uh, your Debian rules file has looked for 10 years or so. Um, now, what happened to me last year is I was looking at this and I realized, hey, there's some code duplication here. <laughs> so, let's refactor it. And so the idea here is that DH binary arch just runs everything that your binary arch target would do. So that's simple enough to write. And that's DH. It went into Dev Helper 7.0 back in last year. And when you use DH for an entire rules file, you come up with something that looks something like this. So for every target, for every standard target, you run DH. And you just give it the name of the target. Now you might ask, what about um, dependencies between targets? What happens if I run um, the binary arch target, and I haven't run build yet. And the answer to that is that DH is intelligent. It tries to figure out behind your back, basically, what it's or what's, what you've already done and what it needs to do next, even without targets in there. Now, if you want to, you can put targets in there. You can put stamp files and all that kind of thing like you've had before. But the fact is that you don't need any of them. And the nice thing about that is that we can notice, hey, there's code duplication that's fine. Let's refactor it. <laughs> and so if you're not familiar with uh, make pattern rules, what this does is the percent up here stands for any of the rules in that file. The punctuation here stands for the name of the rule. So basically, if we run Debian rules build, this is going to run dh build. And if we run Debian rules binary, we run that dh binary, and et cetera. So with that change, some interesting changes began to happen to the length of rules files in Debian. Unfortunately, I didn't collect historical data here, so it's just the current data. And to understand this graph, um, going up, we have the percentage of rules files of a given length. Going along the side, we have the length of the rules files starting at 5 over here, which you can't read, and going up to 100 and more lines. Now, the uh, red line here is CDDS which, as you can see, is really good at making the rules file be under five lines, maybe 10 lines, something like that, and then trails off down. And if you look at traditional Dev Helper, which is the black line here, um, you see that it's really good at optimizing the rules files around 40 lines, 55 lines, something like that, and then sort of trails down, and it almost parallels the length of other which is the small percent of packages that don't use Dev Helper or anything else and just do it all by hand. And they, those tend to be longer toward the long end. Interestingly, they tend to be shorter toward the short end. Um, and there's that interesting little hump over here, which I suspect is things that use Yotter or something like that, and I didn't bother to filter those out. So there might be some interesting, weird short rules files out there that, this, that I didn't grab for properly. So, of course, DH is the remainder of the graph, a really tall hump there. 
uh, 45%, almost 50% are pools files that use DH clock in somewhere between 15 and 20 lines. And then there's a previous hump, 15% or so, actually, you know, somewhere in that area, or two lines to five to 10 lines. Um, now there's a reason for the two humps, and that is that if you go back, you have two different variants of the rules file we can use the H. So that's simple enough to understand. Okay. This is market share of the various <laughs> tools um, after the H has been around for a year or so. As you can see, it's gotten almost 10% of use. Um, CDS, I forget what it was at last year, but it was somewhere around 25%. I think I probably eroded it a small amount, but it's probably also gained some more followers. Um, and developer, of course, since most of the rest, there is that 3% of weirdos. So, what does the H command do? It's really easy to figure out what the H is going to do, exactly which commands it's going to run, and the exact order that it's going to run them in. You just tell it to run the command to do no act. You have to run this inside a actual source package or it's going to complain at you but it's useful to see what it actually does. And when we look at what it does, we see these DH auto commands, which you might not be familiar with, or you might be. Um, these had to be added to Dev Helper to support DH. So, what do these things do? Well, they basically figure out what they need to do to build the given source package and magically do it. It's the short answer. So, if we have an auto prompt using source package, They'll run configure, and then they'll run make. And then when they want to test it, well, some tools actually just make tests, some use make check. And they magically somehow figure out which target to run and run it. And if there's an error, report an error, which is sort of tricky to do with make, actually. It's almost impossible, but we did figure out a way to do it. Now, if you have a Python package, they'll do something completely different like this. And there's currently, I think, no generalized test suite for Python. So they don't run a test step. There's no configuration. They just run setup.py and they pass it various things. And I think I'm missing a clean there. I think that's an open office bug because it's actually in the source. OK, so for Perl, they might do something like this, or they might do something completely different. Perl has lots of different ways to build. Um, you know, there's more than one way to do it. Um, but they'll do something, and it's probably the right thing, but it might not be. So, the interesting thing about DH Auto is it's designed to work for the common case, a case like this. You need to build the package by running configure and, and running make. It's been like that forever. These tools can handle that pretty well. What about something like this? You need to build the package, pass it arbitrary arguments to configure. When you run make, you have to do some other weird thing. You obviously can't use the H build for this because I have no idea how to do it. So how do we handle this case? Here's one way. You can say, let's override the H auto configure. And when we do, we'll pass in this without pitching the sync parameter. Let's override the H auto build. And when we do, we won't even run the DH auto build command. We'll just run whatever make commands we like. And the thing you need to realize about this is these override targets are run by DH build and it sort of figures out behind your back, hey, your rules file has these override targets in it. I'll run them. And that's the override targets went in February of this year. Here's some more examples of it. Um, so there's, you know, these handle, you can handle lots of the standard cases that you may be familiar with, like needing to uh, make a file set UID. The HFIX firms, of course, clears all the set UID bits to make sure that when creep in by accident. So you can um, override that, run the H6 firms as normal, and then go back in and make something say you need to. Need to. Um, if you need to, you know, there's other examples. Passing various options to commands is fairly common. Down here at the bottom, I put one in. Um, I remember that at one point, let's see, that something like this, because it was known to not work on some architectures. And they wanted to see the test suite results, even though they knew it was going to fail. So you can basically, I think, these overrides are pretty powerful. They let you do all kinds of configuration and customization of your rules file and still use DH. Here's a, here's a completely real world example for the IkiWiki package. Um, this is the complete rules file. And we can see that 
there's really not too much customization needed here. There's a little bit of weirdness around how to clean up. I don't want to compress file, um, files in the HTML directory because it's breaking some links. Um, and I cast some weirdness to configure for who knows what reason. But the thing that I like about this is when you look at the rules file, you see exactly how this thing is different from every other package out there really quickly. There's, no, there's nothing in the rules file except for the differences, which I think is really handy. You can just say, oh, three differences. OK, I know what they are. And this is a graph of the frequency that various commands are overwritten currently in the archive. So I'm happy about this graph because <coughs> all these down here are the um, DH auto commands, which are basically designed from the beginning to be overwritten because I know that I obviously can't figure out how to handle these cases in all cases. So they're frequently overwritten. And then, you know, there's things like DH install change logs that people frequently need to pass uh, parameters to. So it's pretty common to override that. I'm not really sure why so many people are overriding DH install. Maybe they want to pass a few of the weird parameters it has. Um, so that's a pretty, I, one other thing I like about this is I can now grep the archive and figure out when the helper isn't working for people, when they have to pass in weird parameters and things like that and just get some easy idea of it just by looking at the overrides. So that's helpful for me to make it a little better later. So when I was making this uh, DH thing, I did run into a little problem, which is that we have three programs that handle Python. Now, one of them is actually in Dev Helper. It is completely you know, obsolete. But then there are the other two, DH Pi Support and DH Pi Central. And there's really no consensus which one we use. But I did need to make one be used by default, because otherwise I wouldn't support Python packages, which didn't seem like a really good design choice. And I arbitrarily chose DH Pi support, but that also didn't seem like a really good design choice. So here's a way to force <laughs> Python central. Now, you could do it with the override, and I think that's perfectly valid way to do it. Um, the overrides actually were developed after the second system, which is just saying, run the build, but run it with Python Central. Now, how's that work? It's called a sequence add-on, and it, I developed it pretty soon after I developed the original DH, before I did overrides. So here's some of the sequence add-ons that are available to you now. I don't even know what some of these do. For example, uh, with bash completion, I'm not really sure I think it adds a some dev helper command to your command sequence that installs batch completion files. The Haskell dev script ones, scripts one is very complicated. Um, the most interesting one there is probably with Bolt. And I think there are probably more in the archive. I didn't really do a complete graph. Um, the key point, though, is that all these, with the exception of with Python Central, are add-ons. They're not even included in dev helper. Somebody's gone off and written them. And that's encouraged. And it's as easy as writing a very short Perl module, something like this. Uh, what this does is this is the actual implementation of with Python Central and Dev Helper. And all it says is find where DH Perl is in the sequence that you're going to run. And if it's in there, put in DH Pi Central and then just take out DH Pi support. And this makes sure that DH Pi Central is in a reasonable place. It also makes sure that even if DH Pi support isn't enabled for some reason, we still get Pi Central. Here's a really complicated example from Haskell Dev Scripts, which adds all kinds of weird commands to various points in the sequence that DH auto runs. And what I really like is they go before DH compress, they add DH compress dash x dot haddock, and then they remove DH compress, which Apparently works, but that's the kind of thing that I think might break. Um, <coughs> although I guess I'll have to keep it working now that I know about it. Um, <laughs> so here's the usage pattern for DH sequence add-ons. I thought this was really interesting, especially since the quilt one has only been around for like two months or something like that. <laughs> There's obviously a lot of demand out there from people in Debian to be able to use quilt in their packages easily. And the nice thing about the quilt one is you just say with quilt, and you automatically get patching and unpatching of using, using quilt. Um, no, modific no other modification of the rules file necessary. And again, that's implemented completely without any changes to Dev Helper. So 
the next interesting thing, yeah, they just keep coming, um, was uploaded during DEF CON after significant testing, and it's called Build System Classes. And this is actually interesting to me because it's an enormous modification of that helper that I didn't write. It was written by this guy called Modestus Benius, who may be in the audience, but I doubt it. And I don't know how to pronounce his name. Does anyone know how to pronounce his name? Because when I see that name, I can't help but think of Monty Python. Anyway, um, the build system classes are basically what you get from CDDS, except they're now in the helper, right? So you can ask the DH auto commands to list which build systems they know about. And this is the current complete list. Um, you know, autoconf, various cruel things, make files, Python, CMake, Ant, maybe Sconce tomorrow. No. Yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> it should be forgotten and, and removed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, the interesting thing about this list is it has to be in this order or things break horribly. And the way this works is when any of the auto commands go to build a package now, they say, well, which build system do I use? They figure it out by looking at which files you have in your source package, and those are all the files that are listed in parentheses. So if there's a configure script, it's probably an autoconf package. If there's a build.xml, it's probably an ant package. If there's both, well, we'll assume it's an autoconf package because otherwise we might break some unknown number of packages when we, when we add ant support, uh, which was done in an afternoon about a week ago. Now, the problem, of course, with just guessing is that you sometimes guess wrong. So this does let you override it, which can be really helpful for things like Perl build, where um, there's, there can be a build.pl file. There can also be a makefile.pl, and we'll guess that it's a make maker package and possibly do the wrong thing. So the Perl group, I hope, will start, will start using this whenever they know it's a, it's a uh, Perl build or a module build um, package. The other nice thing about build system support is Modestus went in and taught all the DH auto commands how to build from a different source directory in the top level directory and how to build into a different build directory, assuming that the build system supports it. Of course, autoconf does things like Perl build and that kind of thing don't. But if it is supported, you can build in a different directory and just nuke it easily at the end, like you might be familiar with doing without using Dev Helper. So, third-party build systems can be added by writing another Perl module, and I'm happy with people doing that, especially if it's something really weird that I don't want to maintain. That would be great. The only problem is that Dev Helper will not automatically go off and use your build system unless you do pass this build system switch. Otherwise, somebody could upload a build system that just broke everything, and I really don't want that to happen. So if you want it to be enabled by default, you do have to contribute it to me, and I'll figure out which order to check for it and things like that. Here's an example of a made-up build system, fuconfig. It works something like autoconf, We'd, um, and this would be the complete implementation of that build system. So all we have to do is the check autobuildable subroutine, or actually method, this is object-oriented code, um, goes in and checks to see if there's a fuconfig file that's executable. And if so, when we're configuring in DH auto configure, it just runs it, passes it parameters, and that's it. Now, you might ask what happens for actually building the package, what happens for cleaning the package or testing. The answer for that is this is inheriting from the makefile class. This is object-oriented, blah, blah, blah. So it works, apparently. You can just inherit the makefile, and then when you run build, it will, run, um, it will build using the makefile that fuconfig presumably creates. So, you put all this together and you get something that is not entirely like Dev Helper used to be, with all these weird switches and overrides and stuff like that. And it might look something like this, as I really hope not, because this is pretty over the top amount of stuff being used. But I do hope that these things will make Dev Helper easier for people to use and result in shorter and easier to understand rules files and etc. And with that, I'll thank you for using Deb Helper and uh, open it up for questions. Enrico. Thanks.
Um, one thing that, that I find quite interesting is that in the end, Deb Helber is doing like most of the work, um, but it gets invoked a lot of time during the build process, mm -hmm. and it always has to figure out where is stuff, what can it do, what it shouldn't, uh, and mm -hmm. so on. So I wonder, I mean, it feels like to me we are pretty near the point where you can do like, instead of a b um, hash bank a make, yeah. mm -hmm. do hash bank developer, yeah. and then it figures out what what's in Debian slash at the beginning, and then just do that little bit, which would make it insanely faster in theory. Well, But I, I don't know if that's in a to-do, if that's any... I, th I think that you're right that we're pretty near the point that it would be a pretty easy modification to do that. Of course, policy wouldn't allow you to do that because Debian rules does have to be a make file no matter how perverted and short it is, um, apparently. Um, I don't know if it would really make it significantly faster because Deb Helper was, after all, written 11 years ago for machines that were a lot slower and does have a lot of wacky little optimizations in it to make it start up quickly and figure out where it's at fairly quickly. So you might save a couple of seconds, and it might be... It might be a shorter and more comprehensible rules file, but then again, I think that the way that we have overrides in here does sort of use make in a fairly sane way. It's a useful use of make. If Deb Helper were up at the top, we'd have to have some other way of doing these overrides, and that would involve re-implementing make, so. <laughs> Any others? a uh, dev helper mo um, seven module for doing uh, Java some Java packaging stuff okay and uh, a couple of questions about it with these overrides mm -hmm. can you override uh, things which have been added through sequence add-ons okay yes you can you can override um, using the overrides here any command that DH happens to run it will first go off and look to see if there's an override and if so it'll run the override instead so yes, you can do that. Uh, okay, so when you're adding things into the sequence, you say add after dh Perl, right. and then you say remove dh Python support. Right. So the other part of my question is, can you do double dash with quilt double dash with, Let's and so see. on and so on, uh, and, ha and include several different third-party add-ons? Okay, so you're, s oh yes, yes, of course you yeah. can. You can so use with as many times as you what can. If you, you um, the person writing the, the the second one that gets included mm -hmm. is trying to put something after DH Perl, and for whatever reason, the first one you include has removed DH Perl. Well, then obviously you have a problem, and those two people need to sort that out. I can't really fix that problem without coming up with some much smarter way of figuring out where things go in the sequence, you know, dependency based or something like that. Um, ho hopefully that won't come up that often. I think that the need to actually remove a command should be f pretty rare, unless two packages are conflicting like these two are, and in that case I think they, uh, they have a problem of their own making. Um, and the last thing was, uh, I've got a sort of absolutely minimal Java uh, build system as part of the, the tools for this, which basically says, I've got a bunch of Java files, please put them in a jar. Mm -hmm. um, and I just call that, uh, I've, I've added it insert after DH auto build, and a file in Debian, it will do something, otherwise it won't. Mm -hmm. And is there any reason why I should uh, write it as a build um, a build system right. class, and which then people have to explicitly mm -hmm. use, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than just saying with Java Helper, and then right. it just does it. Well, I think it's up to you which one makes the most sense to use in a given case. Um, the build system classes um, are useful in that you can use them even if someone isn't using DH. It's possible to you if you don't like DH, you, don't, you obviously don't have to use it, but you still might want to use DH auto build uh, in your rules file just to let it take care of building for you and so it's clear what's happening. And if in that case, if you have a build system, then DH auto build will actually know how to handle it. If you're using, you know, if you're using um, with to add something to the DH command sequence, then that won't happen. So that might be one reason. But it, it really is up to you which one makes sense. And there is a bit of overlap, clearly. All right. I, I see here that um, 
that in Lenny we currently have Deb Helper 7015. Mm -hmm. Uh, so during the squeeze release cycle and development cycle, should we avoid using overrides because they're not in Lenny, right. or or is this going to be added to a point release to Lenny or something like that? Well, um, now I, I have given all the versions that you need, and of course you do, you do need to make sure you build depend on those versions if you use one of these new features. Um, as always, when a new feature is added to Deb Helper, people do wonder about this, and I generally hope that someone will backport it but I can't really do anything more than hope um, or possibly backport it myself, but I'm not gonna try to get it into stable at this point. Um, so it's sort of up to you whether you wanna use these new features or wait a release cycle to do so. I'm personally using them in my packages because I think the, the minor pain of having to backport Deb Helper more than makes up for, I mean, it's more than made up for by actually being able to use new features when they come out. Well, already we can at least use the um you can already use the DH stuff. The DH stuff uh, and the sequence add-ons at you least, You can use right? sequence add-ons. Of course, yeah. you can't use sequence add-ons that have been added to Unstable in another package. Right, right. You also have to, when you use a sequence add-on, figure out what package is providing that. It will depend on that package. Um, the make, yeah, here. The, the make file override thing um, is parsed by Perl, I guess. Yep. So that would mean that you have to be a bit careful about how nope. to specify them? No. Um, it turns out the, the way we, uh, yeah, the way we um, figure out that there are overrides in the make file is by asking make to list all the targets that are provided by the make file. Now, make doesn't have a really elegant way to do this. It's possible that its output might change, but any valid make file will work. You could even, I think, I'm not sure if you could include another file and use overrides in that one if make would tell that, it's, that those targets are available or not, I'd have to check. But you can use all kinds of make constructs in here. There's no parsing of this going on that is fragile or anything like that. That actually actual surprises me because I was told for a very long time that the reason we don't have um, is that it's impossible binary arc so is that it was impossible to do. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> so it's, <all>. okay. <laughs> it's apparently not. It's, it's <laughs> not pretty to do. It'd be nice if Make just had a really easy way to test if a rule was in a file, but it's not there. I can show you the code if you're interested. Maybe I'm <laughs> it, It's really grody. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, it involves running Make in debug mode and parsing its debug mode output. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to use DH for packages that build multiple binary packages with different configure options? Ah, that's a good question. Um, currently, if you want to do that, you'll have to manually override DH configure and DH, I mean DH auto configure and DH auto build and run those yourself and DH auto install and install it in yourself probably. Um, there was a bug report filed yesterday uh, with some suggestions in this here. I don't think it actually completely covers that case, though. Um, so if you're doing something, you know, really out of the ordinary like that, well, potentially a little bit out of the ordinary like that, I'll say, you do have to override it and do it by hand. But I think that's really okay because you'll end up with a rules file that will pretty clearly show what you've had to do, and it's probably not any worse than beforehand, I hope. <laughs> so. Do you expect uh, DH to kill off CDBS? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, don't know. Um, well, I guess I'll look at the graph in, in a year or so and see if uh, people are just switching from Deb Helper to CDBS or if they're switching from CDBS to DH or what. Uh, personally, I would prefer that when I edit a rules file, it use Deb Helper or DH or something like this and not CDBS or IATA or something like that. But I'm not going to try to dictate to the project what they should do. I'm just going to provide the tool. And if you want to use it, there it is. Colin? My, my question is oh. a CDBS one, too. I, oh, the, the, okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. The abstract uh, specifically says how it can be better than CDBS. So I, and I, haven't, I haven't really addressed that, have I? Exactly what okay. you think the differences are well, and why you don't like let's CDBS, address that. et cetera. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one way of looking at Deb Helper and DH and CDBS and comparing them. 
And what I like to do is just look at what I think of as the visible surface area of a command. Now, I realize this slide is really scary, especially if you're in the back of the room, and it's sort of meant to be. This is all the things that you might need to know if you're using Deb Helper in a rules file. You have to know all these strings, what they do, when to use them, etc. Now, of course, we have some long options, we have some short options, we have some environment variables, we have some package, we have some package control files in the Debian directory, and then we have some commands. And that's the interface to Deb Helper, right? Here's the interface to CDBS. Now you have to be about here to see it, right? <laughs> we have some make files, fragments that you need to include. You might not need to include all of these, but most of them are things you might need. We have some options, about 150, I don't know, a lot, that you might want to use at some point if you can figure out what they do, if they're documented, if they don't change what they do tomorrow. Um, some of these are semi-internal-ish. A few of them are probably completely wrong and you would never want to use them, but it's really hard to tell. And some of them are very well documented in the manual. And then down here at the bottom, you have a couple of mi minor changes that you might want to make to your rules file to run other commands and things like that. So when we look at DH, this is the visible surface area. Now, of course, this is added on top of Deb Helper, but then so again, so is CDBS. It's 153 items plus the 100 odd items from Deb Helper that you might want to need to know because you can mix and match. Now in DH, we're adding 12 items. We have overrides. We have a few commands. We have a few options. So I think it's really elegant that I was able to do it with this little, if I say so myself, that I was able to do it with, these, with, this, few, um, with this few addition to the visible surface area. So that's personally why I think the DH is better than CDBS. Um, it's up to you to decide. I think Jonas is going to have a comment now. <laughs> and I, and I, have I, to I, I must say, we, we looked a bit uh, on that spe specific one together. Yeah, I did and, give you advance uh, warning and of actually, this. And actually, I must say, uh, could you switch back to yes. the, the uh, ugly one? Yeah. How completely wrong is um, this? <laughs> I did spot one of them in the middle, around the middle somewhere. I don't remember which one was. <laughs> That CD, that, that Deb Helper does not support. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is true. CDBS has an option yes. that Deb Helper does not support. There, are, there are, okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There are options in <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the that's the auto update. There are options. The one that is illegal to use. <laughs> right. I wonder why Deb Helper doesn't support that. I, is that really the only thing that CDBS does that Deb Helper doesn't support? Because if so, gosh, you've got a big interface for that one thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I think about this, I like to think of this. Now, when you're building a ship in a bottle, you need all kinds of specialized little tools to reach in through the neck of the bottle and lift the sails up and then attach the rigging. And, you know, you need a little tool to adjust that cannon just right and all these things. And there they are, right? <laughs> now, granted, we are building... We could say, well, there's lots of tools here, but the fact is this is a whole workshop of tools that's out there for you to do whatever you want to mash around with. These things are all reaching in through the neck of the bottle of environment variables, settings, and making changes to that ship in there. And sure, it looks really pretty when you're done with it, but gosh, it's really complicated to get there. So, Colin. Uh, so you've, uh, you, I just checked, you've been working in DevHelper for about 12 years now, yeah. I think. Um, and, you know, free software development is always kind of incremental and you do what's, uh, what's needed at the time. But I'm interested to know if you have a, if you have a sort of end goal in sight. <laughs> Uh, um, are, you, are you ever going to stop and work on something else? Or are you going to, uh, <laughs> are you going to declare Deb Helper done? Or is it something that you see as always evolving to right. meet the needs of Debian? You know, the end goal for Deb Helper was actually accomplished like seven years ago. The end goal was, let's make the rules files a little bit prettier and easier to understand, hopefully, and you know, easier to make broad changes to large swaths of packages by changing one thing instead of having to modify a lot of rules files. And that was accomplished, and I thought I was done. And then in the past year and a half, I thought, well, gosh, there's this CDBS thing, and it's really showing that there's a need to do something else. So thank you, Jonas, for that. Thank you very much. 
for showing that there's a need and demonstrating it in a way that made me actually have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> um, am I going to continue to be interested in this? I don't know. Somehow it has remained interesting. I think it's because working with Deb Pelper is a great way to completely destroy Debian by accident. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that can be interesting. Um, I actually had to do full distribution regression testing um, to test the build systems option, which I've never done when I've added something to Dev Helper before, believe it or not. And um, I did find one or two packages that were broken by the new system, but I actually thought it was worth putting it in and just following a couple of bugs. Um, and unfortunately, one problem with the new um, build systems and with DH is that they have some, they have a lot of very specific things encoded in them, like the order that in which you run commands. And if you change that order, you can break untold numbers of packages now. So I have all kinds of ways to break Debian by accident now. So maybe I'll be interested in it for another 10 years. Who knows? <laughs> well, um, I, I think the decision what will be used, the help or the CDBS, will be done by the documentation. And it is not really hard to be, have a better documentation than CDBS. I was always fighting with it. And I'm really, really happy that mm -hmm. I see now these very easy rules files. Well, as far as the documentation goes, there is a man page for DH. Can you see that in the back? I'll make it a bit bigger. Um, there is a man page, and it has some little examples at the bottom, some, you know, which I basically just reused in this talk. And I think that if you read that, you pretty much understand enough of it to use it. Or if you just read a couple of rules files, you'll probably understand it. So I hope that that's enough. Um, if not, maybe I should turn this talk into a bit more documentation. Just a small comment about documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I read about your new DH work last year, mm -hmm. I said, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. So I tried to actually migrate my small, really small mm -hmm. package to it. And I couldn't find anything uh, similar to a how-to or a mm -hmm. really, really simple, yeah, you true. have to do this. Yeah, this is the equivalent of this. Yeah. For example, patching. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still trying to find out how to do the patching. Are you talking about quilt patching or just generic patching? Uh, applying patches to, yeah. my, to the source of the... By hand, in the rules file, basically. Yeah, and I mean, the way you would do that is you would probably go into your rules file and make an actual build rule and a clean rule of your own. Or you could override DH auto build and DH auto clean and put the patching in before that, but it's a little... Mm, I don't know if you'd want to do that. You'd probably just go back to the old, old or older style rules file that has all the, all the um, targets explicitly in there and then do the patching by hand that way. I think that would be the way to go. I think it's OK to not use this really short stuff if your rules file is doing something a little bit out of the ordinary, which patching sort of is because there's no established way to do it except for using Quilt. Of course, if you switch to using Quilt, it's very easy. You say with Quilt, and then you put your patches in the right place, and it all works. Um, now, as far as your broader point about the documentation, yeah, I think it'd be great if somebody wrote a little tutorial. Here's you know your typical rules file and some things in it, and here's how it looks when you convert it over to Deb Helper v7 and DH and all the other new things. Yeah, or, so, yeah, or just a wiki page with a list of wiki packages yeah. using Deb Helper. Yeah, DH? sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. That will be I have great. a list right here. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, well, now that we seem to be converging a bit on Quilt for patching, um, wouldn't it be possible to just check for a Debian patches series file and then assume it's Quilt and, and right. try to do that? Because otherwise, I mean, that, that seemed to be the most overridden thing, mm -hmm. which you... Right. Is there any plans for that? Well, or? it is the most used with flag. On the other hand, I like the fact that there were no changes made to Deb Helper to implement that. And I'm hoping that we get a, pat a source format that actually natively supports Quilt that's actually supported in the archive. So I'm sort of reluctant to make Deb Helper have some kind of special Quilt feature in it at this point, because you know it'll be temporary and it'll be more cruft. Um, speaking of cruft, there are a few faults steps that I made when I was implementing DH. There are some flags uh, before and after and things like that that you can pass the DH to control which part of the sequence it runs. And those are all basically cruft at this point because they turn out not to work very well. So <laughs> this, I really need to stress that this is an evolving thing. Um, I've been talking with, for example, Sam Hartman's, and he's pointed out a couple of cases where the emulation of make, the emulation of make the DH does 
isn't exactly right, and you might run a target and DH just says, oh, we've already done that, just like as if there's a stamp file for every target, which can be really annoying if you want to run Debian rules um, binary twice in a row to see if your change has made, made the change that you want to make. And so I really think this is still evolving. Um, there'll probably be some minor tweaks. There might be a new compatibility level that changes some things. Who knows? I just want to stress that because it's obviously, thank you. This is obviously still a work in progress. Anybody uh, else? Hello. Um, uh, this is all very good. I like this. Uh, <laughs> um, have you noticed that the dpackage now supports dpackage vendor, which is a mechanism for building all sorts of uh, derivatives? Hadn't uh, noticed that. And uh, having done a lot of rules file patching over the last few years, we've found that by far the easiest way to make things work is if the, the meta build systems actually support the changes you want to make rather than changing a million rules files in the mm -hmm. same way. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you've looked at or thought about how uh, this stuff might use, you know, effectively a, a deep package vendor override, mm -hmm. like deep package architecture, to, to say, we're building this flavor and automatically do the right stuff. Right. I have, I have to admit, I haven't even heard about the um, DH override vendor or whatever it's called. Um, I, I think it was mentioned to me earlier this morning, but um, I haven't really been following the list too much, so you have to bring things to my attention directly if you want me to know about them if there's something that isn't, you know, directly impacting DevHelper, obviously. I guess there is some possible, you know, way to make DevHelper and DH do the right thing magically if this is set, and maybe we can look at doing that. Of course, you still then have to deal with all the rules files that don't use this and that never will, and you know, which is going to continue probably forever. I think we're going to have the old style rules files until the end of time. And I think that's perfectly okay. I don't have any problem with them. Yeah, I mean, the advantage, obviously, an awful lot of stuff does use Deb Helper, and then if mm -hmm. Deb Helper just does the right, right. thing, and, I mean, the maintainers don't need to care, which yeah. is exactly what we all want, really. Yeah, and if you can get it down to one Deb Helper command or a few Deb Helper commands that need to be modified to do the right thing, then it's much easier. If it's a matter of, oh, we want to go and insert say we're building for Ubuntu, we want to go insert a new dev helper command in the sequence automatically type thing, then that gets a little bit more iffy because, you know, DH sequences aren't going to be used for all packages. So that's only solving, um, what was it, 9% um, of your problem. So... Uh, I guess basically um, anybody who cares about this should come and talk to um, uh, me and Joey and people. There'll be a, there'll be an MDB and Boff later, which is maybe one place to okay. talk about this. I don't know if there's a better venue. Probably not. Is that it? Okay. Well, thank you all. <laughs>